He's been known as a media mogul, a captain of industry, a lord, and a guest of the U.S. taxpayer. But after writing significant, well-reviewed tomes about Franklin Roosevelt and Richard Nixon, Conrad Black is now widely regarded as one of our most respected historians. His new book is called Flight of the Eagle, A Strategic History of the United States, and we welcome back the agenda's first ever guest to TVO. Here's Conrad Black. Nice to have you back in that chair. Glad to be back, Steve. You, you won't remember this, but it was seven years ago when we launched I, this program. You were guest number one. I remember being here and remember thinking what a very thorough and courteous interviewer you were, but I, I had forgotten it was your first program. It was indeed. Well, a lot of people have written a lot of history about the United States of America, yes. and some may wonder, what was left to tell? Perfectly reasonable question, and uh, and I would not have written the book if it wasn't from, as I thought, a, a new angle. And the introductory note by Henry Kissinger does make reference to the fact that it's a different perspective. And essentially, I, I think that the vast literature on American history, much of it first-class work, uh, essentially creates the idea that it was an inexorable flow of events that. Uh, um, English-speaking people with a democratic tradition and a revolutionary mythos had the ability to populate half of a rich continent. They attracted highly motivated immigrants from all over the world, and it just grew and grew like a tree in your garden. Uh, and there is, of course, a lot of truth to that, but it only became such an immense power in the world because of the decisions of American statesmen, most of them quite famous already, not, the, not requiring recognition from me, though, though some have been underestimated, like James K. Polk, for instance. Um, but those statesmen doing things that they're not generally credited with doing. Uh, bold, imaginative uh, acts of statesmen that made a tremendous difference in, in how the United States got through one crisis after another. We'll go through some of those in just a moment, but I wanted to pick up on your subtitle, which is a strategic history. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what makes a strategic history well, as opposed to any other. Yeah, well, it, it's, it focuses on and is based on the strategic decisions and the implementation of them that constituted the progress of the United States from these relatively obscure colonies on the east coast of this continent to the tremendous power in the world that it has been for the last hundred years. And, and uh, it does not purport to be a full history of the United States. There's almost no cultural history. There, there's a sketchy reference to most domestic legislation. It's only there insofar as it affects the general state of stability of the country. And yet, almost 800 pages anyway. Uh, Steve, every person who has ever held the office of president, vice president, or secretary of state is mentioned there. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are just mentioned because they didn't do very much, but, but they're all mentioned. It, it, even in that scaled down form, the history of the U.S. since the Seven Years' War is a big subject. It is. And it, now that you're on the subject, President, Vice President, Secretary of State, mm -hmm. I learned, having read this, two men have held all three of those jobs, this and you're going to tell us who they are. Do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Thomas Jefferson and Martin Van Buren. Absolutely. I knew the first one, didn't know the second one. <laughs> okay, the first There's of... There's only one who's been Secretary of State and Vice President, but, n but not President. Vice President and Secretary of State, yeah. but not President. That's right. Did you mention it in here? Yes. John C. Calhoun. Okay, you got me on that one. All right. <laughs> I'm going to have to do better going forward. Here's the first of a few references that we're going to make to your uh, book here. Uh, excerpt number one. There was, with most, some notion of ultimately building a better society than those from which they had decamped. There was little thought, until well into the 18th century, of constructing there a political society that would influence the world. And there was almost no thought until near the end of that century that there would arise in America a country that would, in physical and demographic strength, as well as moral example, lead the whole world. And I wanted to pick up on that phrase, a moral example, because that's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way who think that America, either rarely or not often enough, lives up to the words of its constitution and the Declaration of Independence to be that moral example. What would you say to them? I would say that I agree with it most of the time, but I think at the end of the Second World War, thanks really to the inspired leadership of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the U.S. was seen as the moral leader of the world because it was the only 
first of all, it was the premier state and the victorious alliance. Even Stalin acknowledged that. Britain could not have continued in the war without the U.S., and as Stalin said, they could not have won the war without both the material support and the 13 million men of the armed forces of the United States, but uh, led by very distinguished generals and admirals. But the, uh, but the greater reason is that the United States, if you take the period from the rise of, of the threat of war in the early and mid-30s through to the end of World War II, was the only country of the major powers that was not one in one way or another to be ashamed of. I mean, th they had nothing to do with the appeasement policies of the British and the French, and Roosevelt clearly dissented from them. Although his ambassador to England did. Uh, yeah, yeah, but he only sent him to England to get him out of America. When he saw how much damage he was doing there, he recalled him as soon as he could, and then, and then dismissed him, never spoke to him again after the 1940 Joseph election. Kennedy. But, but um, uh, look, his ambassador to Moscow a little before that, Davies, was even worse, but he got rid of him too. I mean, he made some bad appointments, but he controlled the policy, not the ambassadors. But the, he, he, he did not uh, write obsequious letters to Hitler, like unfortunately our Prime Minister, Mr. King, did. He, he, and he never believed in appeasing Hitler. And, uh, and, and he, he was, in the 30s, democracy's only leader who wasn't ridiculed in comparison to the dynamic dictators, Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini. And, uh, and of course, during the war with Mr. Churchill, he was the evocator and the voice of democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the co-author of the Atlantic Charter and the, four, and the author of the Four Freedoms you and had, the founder of the United Nations. If you had to recommend one book about Franklin Roosevelt, which would it be? Well, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a setup, you know. And you're Moving trying on. to maneuver me into <laughs> un-Canadian lack of modesty. Yours, <laughs> right. Okay. I, um, I'd like to ask you about some of the founding fathers here and uh, about whom much has been written. Sure. And then perhaps you could tell us what you found sort of singularly unique about them that enabled them working together to create this country. Yes. Let's start with Benjamin Franklin. Um, of course, he's well known as an inventor, an intellectual, a humorist, a printer, a postmaster. He was a doctor in the same way Samuel Johnson was. He was a member of both the the French Academy and, uh, and the uh, Royal Academy in, in London. A very esteemed man throughout the Western world. But in these terms, as a statesman, I think his achievement is underestimated in two or even three areas. As representative of Pennsylvania and some other colonies in London, he did play a role in persuading the British government uh, when it effectively won the Seven Years' War to evict the French from Canada and leave them in the West Indies, even though at that time West Indian colonies were much more profitable because of the sugar, molasses, and, uh, and rum businesses. And um, more importantly, an astonishing achievement when he was Minister of the Revolutionary Government to France, he persuaded the government of France where nothing resembling a parliament had met for 170 years uh, to enter the war on behalf of democracy, republicanism, and secessionism. And in doing so, they virtually bankrupted themselves, promoted revolutionary ideas, and helped bring on the revolution that brought down the monarchy and sent the king and the queen to the guillotine. It was an amazing achievement. And as soon as America had its independence, they ditched the French. The French got nothing out of that war, although the Americans would have had a terrible time winning without them. I mean, the victory at Yorktown was really a French victory. And uh, the third thing I would say was he was in his r wonderful position as president of Pennsylvania, the uh, chairman of the Constitutional Convention. Washington was the president. And the two of them rarely spoke in the debates, but they, they would have singly and sometimes together delegates uh, for dinner. And uh, Franklin was the host because of his official position in Pennsylvania. And, and plied them with drink and twisted their arms and persuaded them and helped get the Constitution adopted. And, and th th that's an, an immense contribution to the founding of the country in addition to all his intellectual attainments. Mm. George Washington? The indispensable man. He kept that army going for seven years. He got no support from the Continental Congress, whom he detested as a bunch of cowardly, venal politicians. 
uh, he, he sometimes had to pay the troops himself, sometimes he couldn't pay them. But he managed to keep what amounted to a guerrilla war going for seven years, and after it was really after six years that he saw his great opportunity and, and acted on it and persuaded the French to help him with it at Yorktown. But he, he, he kept the war going uh, in the famous picture of him crossing the Delaware on, on uh, Christmas Day of uh, 1776 and caught the British and their German mercenary allies uh, hung over after holiday celebrations and completely astonished them. It was a brilliant action. And he, he, after that, was the man who more than anyone else separated the future of America from that of the Latin American countries. He declined the urgings of uh, his officers to take over the government from the utter incompetence who were in control of it until the Constitution was promulgated and you had a serious government. And, and he absolutely declined to accept a third term as president. He, was, he, he set a tremendous example of the integrity of the office. And as president, he was a very good president. He asserted the authority of the government within the country. He went, uh, he addressed the the Jews and the Roman Catholics of America saying you will not be discriminated against in this country even though it is discrimination that has caused you to flee to these shores. And, uh, and he, uh, he, had, he was absolutely firm in observing neutrality between France and Britain once they were at war. And he knew that the way to prevent the British and deter them from outrages in the high seas was to keep a, a standing army on the Canadian border. As, uh, as he said, if you want, quoting a Roman general, if you want peace, prepare for war. Mm -hmm. He was a very wise leader. Did you find it odd that he had those kind of progressive things to say about Jews and Catholics, but no. didn't seem to have much to oh, negative mean, uh, to say about slavery? Uh, he, look, at least he emancipated the slaves in his will, mm -hmm. which was more than Jefferson did. Uh, Washington never held himself out as quite the, um, uh, quite the impassioned advocate of human rights that, that Jefferson did. Uh, I don't think he was a hypocrite. He was, from all accounts, quite a firm slave owner. He expected his slaves to work hard, but he did not mistreat them. He never flogged them or anything like that. And, um, and didn't sleep with them like Jefferson did. <laughs> yes, well, uh, 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 this is true, although, <laughs> although his marital arrangements were a bit different, too. But, uh, but you're quite right. You raise an interesting point. I mean, Jefferson famously said, uh, slavery is a fire bell in the night. Well, it certainly was for Ms. Hemings. I mean, if the sage of Monticello was in the mood, then um, uh, certainly alarms went off. Having said that... He had seven children with her. Yeah. Jefferson was another of those indispensable Indeed, men. Indeed, but he was chiefly... He was a limousine liberal of his time, you know. I mean, he, he was a bit of a posture, I mean, saying the tree of liberty must be watered with the blood of tyrants and so on. I mean, it's rubbish. I mean, it's absolute rubbish. But, uh, but he... At, at the Declaration of Independence had in it some serious liberties with the truth. I mean, for a slaveholder to write all that about... Uh, all men being created equal? Yeah, and, and we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, uh, how evident were they to him? But they, if you actually read the Declaration of Independence, the front and end of it are wonderfully written and, and a stirring toxin. But in between is a, is a sort of Nuremberg trial indictment of poor old George III, who was incompetent and mad sometimes, but he wasn't a bad man. And, and, uh, and a, a rather a blood libel on the American Indian, too, the native people. But, but that's not the point. Jefferson took what was, in many respects, a grubby little battle over taxes. The British went way into debt, throwing the French out of Canada, then went to the wealthiest part of the British world, America, which had 30% of Britain's population, and asked them to pay for some of this. And the Americans told them to get lost, and Jefferson presented it all as the dawn of human liberty. Do John Adams or Alexander Hamilton belong on a list with those other three? Um, I would say ha Hamilton certainly. And Madison also, because he was the chief author of the Constitution. Um, Hamilton foresaw the economic future and set up the financial institutions. He was somewhat erratic in other ways. He was, he was a very effective working for Washington. He would not have been as good as, as any of the others, I think, uh, actually running the country himself. Um, Adams, I would say, is a <coughs> he would be the sixth person in the group, but he, he would be less talented than the other five, I think.
Okay. Let's look at some pivotal points in the history of the United States as you've uh, brought it forward in this book and uh, get your views on some of these. For example, could the Americans have won the War of Independence in 1776 without the help of the French or the Spanish? Well, uh, you, they wouldn't have won in that year. But you mean eventually? Eventually, I suppose so. But without the French, it, it, would, it would have gone on for, uh, for some years more. I mean, the, the, the problem the British had was there were two and a half million free Americans, and at least two-thirds of them were in favor of independence. And as we now know from the subsequent history of guerrilla wars, uh, to suppress a population on that, of that size, you, you would need at least a million men, and there was absolutely no possibility of Britain producing any such force. Uh, it, it was a country of under 10 million, and and it, it, it and of that, a significant part were Irish, who were not the most energetic supporters of the regime anyway. They were they were not much less disaffected than the Americans, and um, and they they concentrated on the navy and the navy's ability to keep foreign armies, specifically the French, away from the British Isles. They didn't have a big army. And, and they certainly could never have mustered the forces necessary to suppress the Americans. But it, it would have been very difficult and taken much longer. President Thomas Jefferson initiated the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. How much support was there at the time to essentially double the size of the country? No, uh, the, there wasn't much opposition, even though he exceeded the approved budget. Monroe, on his own authority in Paris, made the deal as special minister. Uh, the, the, certainly Jefferson and Madison, who was the Secretary of State, and Monroe deserve credit for, for snapping it up when it was on offer, but Napoleon just dangled it out because he knew that France couldn't hold it because of the naval correlation of forces. And he, he, he thought he could build the U.S. up as a rival to Britain in the English-speaking world, which he did. What he could not foresee is that when the balance turned and the U.S. was more powerful than the British, the British scuttled under the wing of the Americans, and he just made the Anglo-Saxons stronger and not weaker. Uh, 1823, Monroe Doctrine. How pivotal to the nation the United States would become was that? It was, it was a scam. A scam? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it said... The answer to your question was it was invoked as policy for a very long time. Hmm. Uh, but that didn't so much affect the United States as it did the affairs of Latin America. Canada was always exempt. The Americans always said that British and French possessions in the, in the Americas were grandfathered, no problem with any of it. But um, uh, the Monroe Doctrine forbade foreigners from entering the Americas. And it, and it promised, in effect, in return, that the Americans would not try and intervene in the events of Europe and affairs of Europe. And, and third, it did say, you know, whatever the British and French in particular, but the Dutch also had in the Americas, that was fine. They weren't contesting any of that. Um, well, the fact is, it was in practice enforced by the British, not by the, by the Americans. The Americans had no power whatever to stop the British if they'd wanted to from taking over Argentina or whatever they wanted. They had no ability to stop that. In that sense, it was a scam. But it, it, it did, since it conformed with British policy, which was that they were not interested in taking over Latin America, but they didn't want any more colonial activities in the Americas by the other European powers, and they wanted the the, the dissident Latin Americans to throw the Spanish and Portuguese out, but not for them to be replaced by other Europeans. The, you know, it was a brilliant move. It made look, America look strong by tucking it in right behind British policy enforced by the Royal Navy. Now, where, by, by the end of the U.S. Civil War, it was different. Then the U.S. had the power to do what it wanted in the Americas, and you, you know that um, when Napoleon III in effect took over Mexico, or much of it, uh, Lincoln warned his ambassador and his Secretary of State Seward did that this would not be tolerated. And uh, Lincoln, of course, unfortunately didn't live to see it, but the Americans uh, told the French to get out of Mexico right after the Civil War or, or, or they would e evict them militarily. And at this point, of course, uh, General Grant and General Sherman had by far the 
greatest army in the world. Okay, but you're 30 years ahead of where we need to be yet, so hold uh -huh. off for a second there. No, but the Monroe you're, Doctrine, you did say bring indeed, it forward. Indeed, yeah. takes, it, takes it forward, indeed. Uh, it, uh, upon reading what you had to say about Andrew Jackson, you seem to be part of a, uh, a, a new group of historians who feel this man deserves a second look, that he was much more than previous historians have given him due for. And I wonder if you could tell me what you thought was uh, so extraordinary about him that his six predecessors didn't have. Well, look, he was a terrible man in some ways. He, he, he approved of slavery. He was an enthusiastic slave owner. And, and uh, in furtherance of this arrangement that he made, whereby slavery would be protected south of the Missouri Compromise Line of 3630, but secession would not be tolerated. That's when he threatened to hang his vice president, Mr. Calhoun and when it was suggested by the governor of South Carolina that, that he was exaggerating, suggested to Senator Benton, Benton said, I've known General Jackson a great many years, and when he speaks of hanging, it's time to look for rope. <laughs> but um, uh, he, 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 in furtherance of that, he did move forcibly and contrary to treaties, and in a manner the Supreme Court judged to be illegal but couldn't do anything about it, 250,000 native people out beyond the Mississippi, in which many of them died, not not because they were killed by the by the U.S. government, but because they were vulnerable to uh, diseases that 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 uh, uh, that uh, infested the trip, and, um, and we, which was not conducted in any great comfort. And uh, with all that, he preserved the Union for 30 years, and he preserved it until a time when an insurrection could be suppressed by the, by the free states, they would then be strong enough. Now, I don't think, and I wrote that I didn't think, that that was exactly what Jackson had in mind, but he did have the principle that secession would not be tolerated, and it delayed any attempt at secession for 30 years. And in doing that, he saved the country, and he deserves to be on the $20 bill. But he, he was not a, he, he was a, a very, fierce, bitter man, and, and he, it's horses for courses. He was the right man for certain things, but he, would, he wouldn't have been the right man in, in Washington's place, um, uh, or, or, or certainly in, uh, say, uh, Lincoln's place. Well, let me pick up there. I wonder, having looked at the, at the time when Abraham Lincoln was president, whether or not you could look back before he got into office and imagine whether there were any circumstances where half a million people didn't have to die because of a civil war and slavery might have been ended earlier in a different fashion. Or did it have to come to that? Uh, by the time Lincoln was inaugurated, I think it did have to come to that. At, at that point, the South was sort of spoiling for a, a fight in a way. They, they had felt uh, deeply antagonized and condescended to despite slavery having been clearly recognized in the Constitution, and they had convinced themselves that it was um, uh, fundamental and essential to the conservation of the civilization that they revered. And it, it, it had become a, a kind of absurd totem. I think where, it, where it, it, to take your question back a few years, where it all went horribly wrong, although it appeared at first to be a solution, was with the Compromise of 1850. Henry Clay, Stephen A. Douglas, and Daniel Webster. And they were great congressional leaders, but they established this doctrine of squatter's sovereignty so that each territory, as it, be, as it achieved a population large enough to qualify it for an application for statehood, would then decide itself whether it wished admission as a free state or a slave state. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, uh, uh, this ceases to be a north-south issue, it'll be settled in each place quite, in quite a civilized manner. Well, of course, all it did was lead to miniature, preliminary, uh, you're a baseball fan, grapefruit league civil wars in these states before they were admitted, Kansas and Nebraska in particular, where you had both pro-slave and anti-slavery people uh, shipping pseudo-settlers out and armed skirmishes between them and just absolute chaos ruling these territories. But had it been faced at that point, do you think it could have averted the Civil if War? We, if we hadn't had the squatter's sovereignty thing and it stuck to the Jackson formula, I think so. But, but I think there might have been a chance. 
but these the theory of people like Buchanan and so on, President Buchanan, the president preceding Lincoln, uh, that, that if Lincoln had just let them all secede, they would all come back. And so it was absolute rubbish. If they'd seceded, they wouldn't have come back. Teddy Roosevelt, youngest president ever. How important? Uh, uh, youngest at the time of inauguration, not youngest to be elected. Young, what I don't I mean say? to nitpick, but no, yeah. no, that's just, now wait a sec. Um, youngest president ever elected was JFK. That's right. Youngest president ever was TR. TR, right. Okay, yeah. got it. By the way, I think because the, he inherited the incumbent's the second, isn't he, in both categories? I mean, president Obama was only 40 something when he was elected, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. I, that's, anyway, we're, I'm digressing, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, how important in the, again, in the maturation of this country was this hot headed president? Um, uh, not so much in the maturation, but in, in giving it a sense that it is a great power in the world. Hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, he built the Panama Canal, he, he expanded the Navy, he'd been uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, as his cousin was, and, and as Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr. was. And, um, and he, he had a sense of America being a presence in the world without being uh, absolutely up to its neck in these, in these European, uh, you know, all the chicanery of European diplomacy. But uh, he mediated and won the Nobel Prize for peace, for mediating the end of the Russo-Japanese War, because he didn't want too decisive a victory for either side, because those were the other two powers in the far Pacific, and he didn't want either of them too much stronger than the other for his own American reasons. Handled it very well. And, uh, and he was also invited, in effect, to mediate the Moroccan crisis, which was a dispute between France and Germany, uh, where the Germans were purporting to support the local Moroccans, and the French said, we're basically taking Morocco over. And uh, he declined to go too far into that because he, he, could, he, he wasn't going to get into a, a fracas between the main European powers. But he was, he was the first president of the U.S. to be repaired to by the great powers of the old world to, to try and sort things out for them a bit. And, uh, and he, he you know, had he lived, he, he was only 60 years old when he died, had he lived, he would almost certainly have been re-elected president in 1920. He could have been president longer, but he opted not to be, right? Which he recognized as a terrible mistake. Hmm. Uh, if America is that shining city on the hill, why were they so late to get into both World War I and World War II? Look, the issue in World War I was not was not one where we can fault them for not being in any hurry to get into it. Uh, they only got into that war when they were provoked by German sinking of their merchant vessels. They simply could not tolerate that. Uh, and then they entered the war. But they, it was convenient that the German government made such a colossal blunder because the implications of a German victory in World War I would, would have been very serious. But. Uh, I don't th really think we can fault them for not plunging into a war where they had not been provoked by either side, where they were not seeking anything that was at issue between either side, and where they would have taken uh, casualties on a scale to the numbers of troops they committed, but that would mean between the million dead that the British suffered and the two and a half million dead that the French suffered or even the nearly five million dead that the Germans suffered. They had a bigger population than any of those countries. And if they'd committed to it altogether, I, I, the war wouldn't have lasted as long. We wouldn't have had the Russian Revolution. But they would certainly have taken perhaps a million casualties. Now, the argument can be made now that if they had done it, the world would, would be a safer and a happier place. But you couldn't see that in the summer of 1914. Very few people saw it would be so prolonged a war, and there was no obvious American national interest in it. And remember, Steve, it's easy for us to forgive. That's 100 years ago. Europe wasn't nearby like it is now. You couldn't get there in six hours. You couldn't see live television from there. You couldn't even make a telephone call there. You could send a telegram message, but that's all. Hmm. And World War II, do we, I guess the conventional wisdom throughout history has been that America became the indisputable hyperpower of the world after World War II. You're during it, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, and but I, I actually infer from the book that it happened before that. Do you it, think it, it, it happened before? Yeah, that America. Yeah, well, before is, it was in the war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by by uh, after the fall of France, 
almost everything depended on, as, as, as I wrote in there, everything depended on Roosevelt. Hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, I mean, literally, I mean, the, he, in that year, as you know, he broke a tradition as old as the Republic running for a third term. And had he not been elected, which is now unconstitutional, but had he not been elected, uh, it is doubtful, in my opinion, that Britain could have continued in the war. It could have made an honorable peace. It wouldn't have been overrun. But it could not have continued to fight the war. Because his successor? Well, it would have been Wendell Wilkie. He was a good man and wished to help the democracies. But he never would have thought of Lend-Lease, and he could not have got it through the Congress. Hmm. When, when Roosevelt presented Lend-Lease, almost all the Republicans voted against it. And, and, uh, and he, he had to rely on he had to rely on old-time political arm twisting, which was something that, like all the political arts, he was extremely adept at to get it through. We know World War II eventually ended because of two atomic bombs in Japan. And my question for you is, going further forward, uh, Harry Truman was the guy on the spot uh, at the beginning of the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether, after having looked at it again, that war could have been shorter and fewer people might have died had the Americans used nuclear weapons on Korea. What do you think? I, I don't think that would have been the way to do it. I don't think you could have justified the use, morally justified the use of, of nuclear weapons on China. You, you wouldn't need, I mean, they'd, they, General MacArthur completely destroyed the North Koreans in 10 days. And one of the great military classic victories of, of modern world history the, at the Incheon landings. And, um, and, and is the principle, though by no means the only claim that MacArthur and his advocates can make to his being a great general, which I believe he was. He was a difficult man in some ways, but a great general. But um, um, I, I think you certainly could make the case, and, and many people, and not just MacArthur, but uh, Richard Nixon, for example, John Foster Dulles, uh, made that we, we could have carried on that war, we, the Allied, we, the United Nations, we, Canada participated, as you know, could have carried that war on a little more aggressively and a little longer, and we would have got rid of North Korea. I don't think you needed nuclear weapons to do it. But Mr. Truman, essentially, after General Ridgway recaptured Seoul and they got back to the, to, to the division line, the what, the 38th parallel, was it there? Uh, he, he, he just held that line. And, uh, and, and I, th I think the case was actually made very effectively by MacArthur in his address to the Congress that you cannot ask draftees to risk and give their lives for a goal less than victory in the national interest. Mm -hmm. And that really came to the forefront in the Vietnam conflict. But uh, his view, as famously stated in the phrase, in war there is no substitute for victory, was probably right. I think we could have got rid of North Korea and, lo and look at what we would have been spared. Exactly. I mean, what a nuisance they are even now after all these years. Not to mention a prison camp for the people who live there. Exactly. You mentioned Vietnam and let's go there next. Uh, when um I think when JFK left the scene, there were tens of thousands of American advisors. 16,000. 16,000? Yeah. Okay. And by the time LBJ was done, of course, over half a million. Was yeah, and there, they, were, they weren't advisors. They weren't advisors yeah. at that point. No, they, yeah. indeed, they were soldiers. With the benefit of 40 years of hindsight, was there a better way, a different way, that America should have handled Vietnam that would not have seen nearly 60,000 of its own kids killed? I think so. Uh, first of all, as you know, this is very complicated, mm -hmm. but uh, as you know, I'm rather an admirer of President Eisenhower, but he, to some extent, pulled the pin on, on, on the grenade when he declined to sign the Geneva Accords, which foresaw a one-year period followed by uh, all, you know, a pan-Vietnam election, North and South together, which would be a farce because Ho Chi Minh would deliver all the votes on one side and get some of them on the other side. Um, he declined to sign it and recognized South Vietnam as a permanent entity and guaranteed its defense and set up the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Uh, so the, 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 the timer on the grenade was running from that time on. 
if the U.S. was going to make a stand in Vietnam or in Indochina, the time to do it would have been then. Um, just tell the French to stay there, and stay involved, but give it up as a colony, saying they were merely fighting the communists, they were fighting for the independence of the component countries of Indochina. You have other allies as well. That you could have done, and, and this was before Ho Chi Minh had riveted himself on the North Vietnamese and turned it into a garrison state. And, and it could have been done, like so many of these things, much earlier and much more cheaply. Having missed that opportunity and going up to the Kennedy-Johnson era, if they were going to do it, and I, I, I suspect that Kennedy would have passed on the whole thing, we'll never know. But after the Bay of Pigs thing, I, I think he was very skeptical about what the general staff told him or the Joint Chiefs told him, and um, w with some reason. I mean, you know, five times in one year, the Joint Chiefs came in and asked Eisenhower to use nuclear weapons on China after the Korean War, and, I, and Eisenhower threw them out by the scruff of the neck and told them they were out of their minds and he wouldn't hear of such a thing. He had no the authority to do excuse. it, though. Yeah, well, he, you know, he five was a general. five star victorious theater mm -hmm. commander who led us to the unconditional surrender of our enemies. Mm -hmm. and, he, and, and they were, they purported to be afraid of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, 200 miles across the Formosa Strait with the U.S. 7th Fleet in the middle. And he said, I know something about amphibious landings, which is a great understatement <laughs> since he commanded the greatest amphibious landing in history. Anyway, I think Kennedy would have been skeptical, but whatever that would have been, if they, if they were going to do it, they had to do what Eisenhower and MacArthur both told Kennedy and Johnson to do. If you don't do it, but if you're going to do it, you've got to cut this trail in, in Laos, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Mm. You, you, you've got to come in at the parallel right under it and go right through Laos. But, you know, Kennedy signed the Laos Neutrality Agreement, and unless he'd been prepared to set it aside, at least temporarily, uh, he, he, the, they, it was going to be difficult, but that's what they, if they were going to do it, they should have done that, held that line, bombed the north, not put in anywhere near 550,000 draftees, n and increased the number of trainers from 16,000 or advisors to 100,000, and got the South Vietnamese army up to shape. And, 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 and be, getting involved in the uh, assassination of DM was insane and it was unethical too and it doesn't help your credibility with allies if yesterday's ally Richard Nixon as vice president represented the US at his inauguration is, is suddenly a corpse with American complicity you mentioned Nixon and let's go there next and obviously I asked this question not just of the man who wrote this book but of the man who wrote a book about Richard Nixon as well which is even longer than this one I note he had a very long career he did Richard Nixon, which statement is more accurate? Richard Nixon was one of America's most important presidents or Richard Nixon was one of America's worst presidents? The first is much more accurate than the second. He was certainly not one of the worst. Not one of the worst? No. Because for you, Watergate wasn't as big a deal as China, etc. It, it did look, it was a tawdry, uh, unpleasant, squalid business, but, but it did not severely compromised Nixon's achievements. When he was inaugurated in 1969, uh, there were 550,000 draftees in Vietnam. No one knew what they were doing there. They were coming back 200 to 400 a week in body bags. There were no relations with the Chinese, no substantive discussions with the Russians, no peace process in the Middle East. Uh, there were riots everywhere in the United States, all the time, race riots, anti-war riots, chaos. King and Kennedy were assassinated, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Skyjackings, the country was an utter pandemonium. Uh, four years later, after one of the most successful single presidential terms in the history of the country, all Americans were out of Vietnam and a non-communist government had been preserved. They'd opened relations with China, had signed the greatest arms control agreement in the history of the world with the Russians, de-escalated the Cold War, he was abolishing the draft, he'd reduced the crime rate, there were no riots, there were no assassinations, there were no skyjackings, he stopped inflation, he founded the Environmental Protection Agency. And he still felt a need to cover up a third-rate burglary. He, and he was re-elected by the greatest plurality in the history of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really believe that, you know, what you just said. I, I realize that's the charge, but I don't believe it. And I think the counts of impeachment against him have only one possible kernel of truth in one of them. The rest are complete rubbish. I mean, if you look at them now, it is 
incredible that they were given any currency at all. There's a nonsense. But, um, but the one that, that certainly is a concern to Nixon supporters is the allegation that he uh, paid money to Watergate defendants in exchange for altered testimony. Now, nothing wrong with paying the money. Uh, the American lawyer is the most rapacious person or creature in the world. And, and, and if you don't pay your lawyers in that country, you don't get any legal service. He, and they had to pay for their families. And he, you know, they, they were suspended from their positions, obviously. And so it was quite in order that the Republican National Committee would pay them. And it's never been clear that it was in exchange for altered testimony. And in my opinion, on all the evidence that you, as you would accept, I think, I've gone through this fairly carefully. Mm -hmm. If you do examine the evidence, it is not at all clear that in a fair trial, Nixon would have been found guilty of, uh, of authorizing any such thing. The so-called smoking gun was a fraud. It, there was no smoking gun. It, it was him saying to Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Dean that, if, that they could, if they wished, it was their idea, go and ask the director and deputy director of the CIA, uh, Pat Gray. Uh, uh, no, uh, Richard Helms and uh, CIA now, not, CIA. not FBI. Okay, not FBI. Ra Richard Helms and uh, General Vernon Walters. I spoke to both of them, asked them if they would ask the FBI to lay off because this could back into the CIA's activities against Cuba. They both said, we will do it if we get a direct order from the president. Otherwise not. This was reported to Nixon. He said, I'm not doing that. Don't take it any further. That is not a cover-up. It is not a smoking gun. And both Richard Helms and Vernon Walters told me they did not believe Nixon committed a crime. So why does he resign? He's fought against everybody who ever wanted to do him harm politically for the previous 40 years. And on this one, he decides to go. I think he was ashamed of how he had mismanaged it. He was ashamed of the thought that he was going to bring an impeachment trial on the country. He was a patriotic traditionalist, although he was a hardball politician. He was a very sincere patriot of integrity and anything to do with the national interest and national security. He felt he'd besmirched the office. Uh, he fought for the principle of a national security cover and uh, a privilege on taped conversations in the White House. Had a pretty foul mouth in that Oval Office. You don't impeach guys for that, so did Harry Truman. I'm not suggesting that he was always an elevated man in his thoughts or his words. I'm not suggesting that. What I, what I do embrace is Henry Kissinger's uh, conclusion in his eulogy when he said he achieved greatly and he suffered deeply, hmm. but he never gave up. Should Ford have pardoned him? Yes. It was still the right move. He should have pardoned him, and the Kennedy Center, and Senator Edward Kennedy in particular, but including Mrs. John F. Kennedy, were absolutely right to award Gerald Ford their, their highest award, I forget what it's called, the Kennedy Government Award or something, for having done that years later. And Teddy Kennedy, in the, uh, in the address he gave in handing this over to President Ford, ex-president at that point, said that um, he himself had opposed it at the time, but he now recognized it was the right and decent thing to do. And I think we should remember that Gerald Ford, when told coming up to the midterm elections in 1976, just, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 1974, just a couple of months after Nixon had resigned, mm -hmm. Uh, that, that it would hurt his party in the polls if he visited Nixon in the hospital where he was recovering from his embolism, you know, a blood clot, um, said there's something wrong with this country if a man can't visit a sick friend in hospital and went and saw him. Ford was a good man. Very good man. I, I had the privilege of knowing him. He was a very fine man. Which presidents, in your view, deserve the most credit for winning the Cold War? I would say... Probably Harry S. Truman. Top of the list. I think so, yeah. I think he set up the institutions that won it. He set up NATO and he set up the Marshall Plan. He uh, protected Korea, he protected West Berlin, and uh, he protected Greece and Turkey. I, 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 I think he deserves the most credit. He founded the it originated the strategy, and second, I'd say Ronald Reagan, who carried it to fruition by 
bringing in the strategic defense initiative that all our learned commentariat in this country and elsewhere dismissed as Star Wars and made fun of, but completely psyched the Russians. It just absolutely destabilized their self-confidence. You wrote, after 1991, there wasn't much American strategic policy because, because there wasn't much need for one. What did that mean? <clears throat> they, they had no rival in the world. The, the, as, as Roosevelt saw very clearly, if Hitler had been able to negotiate a peace with Britain and just keep the peace with Russia and consolidated what Germany had annexed, most of Poland, the, what's now the Czech Republic, the Low Countries, uh, part of Scandinavia, part of France. Germany would have 130 million people, which is as many as the United States, and, and, and almost all the rest of the, of the continental powers, except the Soviet Union, were satellites of the Germans, I mean, Spain and Italy and Hungary and so on. And, um, and this would be a mortal threat to America's preeminence in the world, which FDR was very attached to, though I didn't much speak of it publicly. And, uh, and Truman and, and his successors saw that the Soviet Union and international communism were a mortal threat to the United States. There is no mortal threat now, and there wasn't after the disintegration of the USSR. And so from that point on, you didn't need much strategy because there was no one to employ it against. Well, let me pick up on that because, and once again, I'm going to read another excerpt from your book here. Almost two years, you write, before Richard Nixon enumerated his geopolitical reasoning for the outreach to China, he told Americans in his silent majority speech of November 3, 1969, that North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. <coughs> This was the real challenge to American supremacy, the ability of the United States to sustain a will to greatness when it had nothing left to prove, no foreign power to surpass, and no serious direct or even remote threat from any other nation or coalition of nations. And this has proved a doughty challenge in the 20 years since the end of the Soviet Union. Question, how does America continue to prove its greatness with no comparable rival today? It recognizes that there is a challenge that there is a mortal challenge to America, but it is internal. It is the decay of their system. Uh, I suggest in that book that the greatest irony of contemporary times is that we owe to the United States, the world owes it to the US, and we must never forget this and never cease to be grateful for it. The triumph of democracy and the market economy in, in most of the world. And. Uh, uh, when President Truman set up those institutions and said it was the free world versus, uh, you know, versus the godless totalitarian communists, uh, much of the so-called free world wasn't free. Spain, Portugal, all the Latin Americans, uh, the House of Saud, the Shah, South Korea, they weren't democracies. But almost all of it became democracies, not Iran, unfortunately, but almost all the rest of it. And, and democracy has... has triumphed in most of the world and 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 we owe that to the americans but the united states is today not a well-functioning democracy I mean, it functions better than india does but it doesn't function as well as much of europe or this country or australia and here might be one of the reasons why here's another excerpt the united states remains incomparably the greatest most successful country there has ever been and though it is a vulgar banal slovenly and complacent and most of its leadership cadres have failed it, it is neither lazy nor driven by a death wish. Historically, when the United States has needed strong leadership, it has found it. It does need leadership now, and it is not easily visible in the present sea of mediocre strivers. Is there anybody out there right now? You're smiling, because that's not badly written. I got to <laughs> no, hand it to you. No, stylistically, yeah, sorry. It's a bit bad. severe, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK. We, you've established you think Barack Obama is a mediocre, mediocre striver. Is there anybody out there today a little harsh. that you think could break the political deadlock in that country? I'm sure there is. But you know, if asked that question in 1859 or 1932, very few people would have said Abraham Lincoln or Franklin D. Roosevelt. But you don't know until the person is there and actually proves what he or she can do. I hoped, as most of us did, I think, for better things from Obama. I even hoped that George W. Bush would be better than he was. And I certainly hoped that Bill Clinton would be better than he was. But um, <clears throat> I, I, 
You asked me to identify some. I, I'm not sure. I think it is possible. I think I think the following things are. I think the following people could conceivably get the office and do a terrific job in the office and do what needs to be done, which is essentially say, it, 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 sort of the Roosevelt formula: say we have a very serious problem. This is the problem. These are the proportions of the problem. This is our plan of action to deal with, and I ask for your support. I mean, that's what you do. That's and then leadership. get it true. Yes, yes, and that's what you do. And uh, who can do that? Well. I would say on the Republican side, possibly Jeb Bush. I don't like American prosecutors, but conceivably Chris Christie, governor of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And even possibly Marco Rubio. And I'd like to look at some of these governors. This man in um, Wisconsin, Walker, I think his name is, mm -hmm. and a couple of the other governors, uh, the one in Michigan, for example, I, I think they look quite impressive, but I don't know enough about them. Uh, on the Democratic side, astounding though it is, and despite um, a, a great deal of absolute flummery that it is hard to overlook, I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that Hillary Clinton could be a good president. And you wouldn't rule it I mean, because? This is the person who, who, who told us how she had to dodge sniper fire at Sarajevo Airport when the film showed her receiving flowers from the little girl and so on. Uh, this is the person who went and gave that utterly fatuous address to the Muslim world of apologizing for some DVD produced by a, a racist or you know, bigoted kook in Southern California someplace about Islam. Well, I, I, to, propagate the myth that this had anything to do with the murder of the ambassador to Libya. Uh, look, but there's something there you respect about her, clearly. Uh, well, I didn't say, not in those acts, not but in, in those, other things, I, I, think, I, I think she's a competent, capable, tough woman, and she might be a good president. This And by the way, her husband mm -hmm. could help her, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he certainly knows the job well, and he's a very intelligent man. Mm. Very nice man, too, I may say. This is a book that um, I inferred still admires a lot about America in spite of what your experience was with the American justice yeah, system. Look, it, it, the fact that it persecuted me half to death doesn't mean it isn't a great country. I mean, bad things happen even in great places. You know? Well, but that's, that's the question. How, 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 do you, how do you be so positive about a country where your personal experience was really quite miserable? You just, you just separate them. I mean, uh, I mean, I think there are some who would say, for example, uh, quote you read to me about them being slovenly and garish or whatever it was. Uh, I mean, that isn't exactly God bless America, you know, waving the stars and stripes around. But they, um, it's a huge, complicated country that has many faces, and most of them are rather attractive faces. But some aspects of it are, are terrible. But, you know, what Jack Kerouac called the great unwashed body of America is, is much larger than people think and, and, and embraces uh, scores of millions of people. There, there is a, it's a complicated organism where parts are growing quickly and healthily and parts are rotting cor and corroding very, also very quickly. And, and it, it has, as I wrote in there, it is not ceased since it was founded to attract the astonished curiosity of the whole world. No one more than Canadians because we're so close to it. Mm -hmm. Front row seat on all of it. Uh, in our remaining moments here, I want to just pick up on some of the things we talked about seven years ago on this program. Uh -huh. So look at the monitor over my shoulder if you would, because here comes a clip of us from a while ago. Roll tape, please. I've seen those scrums that you've had to do when you get out of the car and you go into the court and they're 25 cameras there and they're all sticking mics in your face. What is it like to be at the center of one of those? Yeah, you don't notice that so much. You know, I mean, the news people are just doing their job and you say what you want to say. You avoid what you don't want to say. You kind of enjoy the, the back and forth a bit. Uh, I would enjoy it more if, if there weren't the restraints of the kind I've just referred to here. I mean, uh, it just would be unwise and in some cases uh, contrary to agreements with other parties or with the courts if I said too much about these things. I mean, my natural instinct would be to be a little more declarative about them. And, and the time will come when I will 
let it, I will let it be unmistakably known what I think of every aspect of these proceedings, but this isn't the time. So the time has come, and you've written a book about all of that, but can, can you say more now about all of that that you couldn't say then uh, that maybe even you haven't put in one of your books about that time? Um, so you call upon me to try and be original. Um, let me see. I, I, I have no objection to having to act spontaneously, but it can be in some ways quite a personal question. So I, I hope your viewers and you will pardon me if I just take a moment organizing my thought here. But um, let, let me have a go at it from this angle. It. I have made it abundantly clear that I did not commit any crimes and would never dream of doing so. Uh, there were 17 counts, four were dropped, nine were rejected by jurors, four were vacated by the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously, but remanded back to lower courts who were excoriated for their errors to assess the gravity of their own errors, and they self-servingly retrieved two of the counts. That's what I'm stuck with. Wouldn't have happened in this country. Uh, the conduct of the prosecutors was completely dishonorable. They'd be disbarred in this country or in Britain. But it is what it is. It happened. I mean, officially, I'm a convicted felon. Now, I, it is with great hesitation that I get into this kind of thing, but I will, uh, I will make an experiment of it here. Um, I am a r rationally and moderately religious person, and I believe that um, life is a privilege and we have an obligation to make the most of it, whatever the circumstances. I had a very difficult time. I made the best of it I could. I did my best with it. I think it's come out well. It's receding into the past. I'm fine. I'm well. Not much that is irreplaceable has been lost. And, um, and I, I went through a very humiliating experience being uh, fired from the business that I built with my associates uh, and indicted and convicted and sent to prison, uh, released and then sent back to prison. Um, but the Bureau of Prisons and the federal court in Chicago said I was an exemplary prisoner, commended me for what I did when I was there. I did the best I could. I've done the best I could throughout this thing. And I believe that there is some likely reason, uh, insusceptible to my discovery of it, though it is, for such a downfall as I suffered to have occurred. And I accept that, in, if I may say so, in a completely humble way. I mean, it's, came, it's an accident of life. And, and um, I have tried to extract from it whatever lessons I could and try to grow as a person as a result of it. It's not for me to say whether I've succeeded. Uh, I'm not making any claims at that point. But in that, as in all other aspects of it, I did my best. What do you think the reason is? I, now you're, you're literally asking me to put myself in the, uh, in, in the shoes of whatever supernatural authorities may rule the uh, cosmos. And I, 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 Steve, I can, uh, I can have a good imagination, but I, I'm not going to do that. Okay, let me ask you one more. Your next birthday will be your 69th, I think. Yes. Most people on the verge of 70 are not necessarily looking for the next act in life. Right. Are you? Well, I, I, I have a plan, not all of which has been made public, that I'm executing to... Uh, to uh, carry me past what you imply is the normal retirement age. And you're right, but most people don't have 10 years carved out of their life by the U.S. government and its, and its local acolytes. So, uh, you know, I, uh, my wife and I agreed that we would try and conduct our, our lives uh, in, in, a, in a way to, to try to come out of this in better shape physically than we went into it and to try to add on in the latter, fa in the latter section of our lives um, the, the time that was taken away from us. Now, you could never be precise about this, obviously, but I feel well. I feel like I did 30 years ago. 
And, and instead of retiring, if I was ever minded to do it at 70, I, I, I'll do it at 80. I mean, if my health holds, obviously. And do you have uh, dreams of running a company again? Not a public company. You, you couldn't pay me enough to get back into that. They're very, as my mother used to say, I've reached the age and stage where there's some things I won't do anymore. Not, I want to be clear that I detect uh, the business community of this or other countries clamoring for my return to public companies. But, uh, but you, you, commerce is a vast field and you can, you can approach it in different ways and avoid the, the minefields or controversial areas that you know that you've been in before. True, but I, I don't think, even as high selling as your books are, that you can make as much money doing this as you could in your previous life. Yeah, uh, but it's not an either or thing. I'm, I've done my commercial relaunch already. I'm quite active commercially, but as I said at the outset uh, when I was released from prison, I, uh, uh, they're, they're not in public areas, so I won't comment on them. Okay, but as the new company, I mean, you've got a television show coming up, you're obviously going to be writing more books going forward. Is this the new you? Uh, well, the one aspect of my career, apart from whatever efforts I made at kind of a greater and more philosophical and patient comprehension of things that flourished in, in that lost decade of fighting for my existence, um, in all respects except physically and possibly even that, um, it was as a writer, both both uh, a periodical writer and a writer of books. I mean, since the whole thing, this is the fourth book that I've published since that crisis got going, and and um, and I have approximately four million readers a week in one place and another. So that part's done well. But no, you're quite right. I couldn't live the way I, mean, I live quite well. I live, my standard of living hasn't changed much, you know. And, and I couldn't live that way on what you make as a writer, but I have other sources of income and I work on those too. Writing's a hobby. When a trim young chap like you is out playing golf or tennis or something, I'm writing away. Hockey. Hockey. Uh, well, Never that, golf or no, tennis. Well, yeah, that you're, a, <laughs> you're a brave man. <laughs> You've talked about your, ex very candidly obviously, about your experiences in prison and, and what you found to be the shortcomings of the justice system and the fact that there are, is it hundreds or thousands of people who've matriculated from high school behind bars who otherwise wouldn't have had you not been there? No, no it's not thousands. It, it, it hundreds. Would, it would be, I, 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 we got all our lads through. We had a little over a hundred. Is there anybody you're still in touch with? Oh yes, lots of them. From behind bars? Some, and some in half as, and some released and back into society. And why are you still in touch? Well, I, I developed an interest in them, and some of them are quite interesting people, but whether they're particularly interesting as people or not, and some of them are, the, the ones I'm in touch with are, are people that you want to help. They're good people. They got a thin, a short straw, you know, thin edge of the wedge. I mean, I, I at least had a, a short sentence, and and uh, started in a low security place and the court made it clear they didn't want me sent to a high security place. And, and there was no, re you know, that's for violent people and they, not even the prosecutors tried that one on me. And, um, uh, and, it, it, and I, I, you know, I, I, had, um, I had these columns I was writing, I had all these readers, I had to, legal teleconferences two or three times a week. I had visitors almost every eligible day, including some very prominent people. And so the, the, the authorities didn't particularly bother me. Now, I did not infringe any of the rules. I never bothered them. And, but I made absolutely no effort to, uh, to seek any relationship with them. I, I just steered clear of them and they didn't bother me. But many of the people there were, you know, and I had the means to defend myself and, and to fight on. These people were just wiped out in the first days of the prosecution. Some had actually broken the law, but were terribly over-sentenced in the American manner. One person you've got 20 years for driving a truck with marijuana in it. Well, that's not a fair sentence. And, um, and so, I, you know, you, there are the sort of people you want to help because they, they really have been disadvantaged. And, uh, and some of them, in addition to that, are really very interesting people. Okay. A few more quickies. Number one, have you talked to David Radler at all since you've been out? No. N nor nor uh, not the last time I spoke with him was uh, he phoned me to wish me a happy wedding anniversary in 
July of 2005. I have had no contact with him. Of any Did you time. take the call? Yeah. Well, you spoke he, to him well, on he that hadn't gone over to the other side at that point. Oh, right, of course. Okay. Do you have any, uh, will you ever speak to him again? No. You will not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are there people who have rediscovered your phone number who lost your phone number when you were going through all your legal travails, but you're out now and you have paid your debt to society, as it were, and they think it's kind of cool to have Conrad at one of their book launches, parties, dinner parties, whatever now. Is that happening? There, there, there's been a bit of that, Steve. Yeah, I, I wouldn't overstate it, but there's been a bit of that. But for, the, for the most part, uh, the people that I knew before, and I knew a lot of people, <coughs> are, 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 have been either supportive or just vanished from the scene, and most of those who vanished from the scene, um, I, I would not particularly want to see them again. And they either, well, if it's not for me to impute motives to them, for whatever motives, they wouldn't try to revive things. But some who vanished have returned, and in most cases, I welcome that. I, I don't, you know. I, I mean, I, I certainly people that at really did outrage, what I consider to be outrageous things. None of those have tried to reopen contact, and, and I wouldn't. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we would agree that it wouldn't be appropriate, and neither they nor I would wish it. Last question. Why don't you ever write short books? I do. I claim matter of principle was quite short. Was How many pages was that? Uh, counting appendices and everything about 500. Okay, that's not what most people consider to be a short book. Lord Black. <laughs> so the question stands, why don't you ever write shorter books? Um, well, I'm a nonfiction writer and the subjects tend to be somewhat complicated. I mean, in fairness to myself, a cause that I can still become quite impassioned about, um, that's not the full history, but, a, but a, in, a, in effect a political economy history of the United States going back to the Seven Years' War. And I get a terrific amount of stuff in there. I mean, it may be a 700-page book, but, but it's a book that many others would take volumes to write. Mm -hmm. I mean, my one volume on Roosevelt was a big book, but you know, Arthur Schlesinger wrote three times as many pages to get as far as 1936. And look at how many books on LBJ by yeah, well, one man in his 80s. I mean, Caro's abusing it. I mean, <laughs> LBJ was a very interesting man, but five volumes to get him in as president is too much. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Uh, we're delighted that you accepted our invitation to be here at the studio seven years after your first appearance here. Flight of the Eagle is your latest, a strategic history of the United States. Conrad Black, great to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stephen. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.